The University of South Florida and Roompact presents Res Ed 2.0, Innovative Engagement for Student Success and Academic Excellence. Hi everybody, my name is Julie Leos. I'm the Director for Residential Education at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. Welcome to Res Ed 2.0, a four-part webinar series dedicated to residential student success and academic excellence. You see, as scholar practitioners in a residential setting, we are called to share with others that our laser focus and commitment to student success is a part of a new understanding of what it means to educate as housing professionals. Some might call it a new approach or a new lens. A residential education goes beyond the constructs of a building, of a bed, of a lounge. You see, residential education is what remains when those things are no longer available to students and those things are no longer a part of their life. The learning they had, the commitment they made to themselves, the connections that they made with others, all of those things that are made possible because of educators like you. That is a residential education. Now, you might be here because you want to strengthen your residential curriculum. You might be here because you are wanting to strengthen your ties with faculty or other academic partners. You might want to also um, learn a little bit more about how to assess your program. Whatever the reason is that you are here today, we are so happy that you're here and glad that you chose this space, this community, to enhance those skills. Now, I can't wait to learn with you today. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to our series committee. Thank you. The University of South Florida and Roompact presents Res Ed 2.0. Innovative engagement for student success and academic excellence. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Res Ed 2.0, Innovative Engagement for Student Success and Academic Excellence, live from the University of South Florida. We are so glad you are able to join us virtually as we all navigate this new remote world together. Now more than ever, our role as educators is so important. When planning the series to be remote, that was our guiding principle. No matter where our students may be, we must do our best to support student success and academic excellence within residential education. We hope that during your time with us today and throughout this series, you are able to learn new ways to enhance opportunities to foster student success within your institutions. Although we can't meet in person, we hope that you are also able to connect with other professionals and share ideas throughout the stream. Use the chat function to ask questions, comment on anything you hear today, and share your knowledge as an expert in the field. Student success is a shared responsibility, and we hope that you discover something today that will help you on that journey. You can find more information about upcoming presentations, the presenters themselves, and even the whole series found on our website here below. We will also be recording and hosting the stream today thanks to our friends at Roompact, and we would like to thank them for being a part of our team. If you liked what you learned, share with colleagues and come back for the rest of our program. So sit back, relax, and put on your favorite pair of professional attire sweatpants and enjoy today's live stream. This is Res Ed 2.0, innovative engagement for student success and academic excellence. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so excited that so many of you are here. Fill in the chat with the shout outs for where you're coming from and where you're tuning in from. This is awesome. We're so, so glad you could join us. Welcome to Res Ed 2.0, Innovative Engagement for Student Success and Academic Excellence, live from the University of South Florida. And I'm in my apartment on campus, just like any housing professional would be. My name is Michael Prozia. I serve as a senior residence life coordinator here at USF. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I will be moderating today's webinar on academic and cultural engagement. Before we get started for the session today, it would be remiss to not acknowledge what is occurring in our society right now. People across the country and our profession are hurting. I know I speak for myself saying the last week and a half has been exhausting. Yet my exhaustion pales in comparison to the anger, sadness, and exhaustion of my black colleagues. Today, I fully acknowledge that our panel is made up of white professionals. Know that we would not be in this place without the tireless work of black, 
black professionals in higher ed and in res ed here at USF. We hear you, we're with you, and we support you. Black lives matter, and we are committed to lifting up the voices and the professional reputations of black colleagues in our field. Today, I specifically thank black members of my residential education team who helped put this webinar together, and their names are Chasmine McCoy and Paige Hicks. After today, I encourage you to check out the resources I'm about to drop in the chat uh, around the ways that you can become anti-racist and consider donating to organizations in support of this work if you're financially able to. So let me take a minute and just drop those in. There are two links there for you to check out and I encourage you to do so. Continue learning and continue supporting our black professionals during this time and in the future, even when it's not in our news that another black man is killed across the country. With that being said, uh, we have three awesome panelists joining us for today's session. We have Dr. Paul Gordon Brown, who is an ed tech researcher for RoomPact. Brandy Cruz, who's a coordinator of academic initiatives at the University of South Florida, and Jack Walden, who is a residence life coordinator at the University of South Florida as well. With that being said, everybody can turn on their video. Give us just a second. Hi there, this is Paul. We just cannot seem to join our video because it says the host has not allowed it. So oh, that is uh, so fascinating. We've got someone going on in the background trying to figure out how to correct that, but I assume you can hear me. So I think that's good enough. You don't want to see my COVID haircut anyways, <laughs> uh, and my mustache, which I don't think anyone's ever seen. So <laughs> we'll be all right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for doing that. So Brandy and Jack, if you want to unmute yourselves as well, Hello. Just say hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Ah, absolutely. Um, so Paul, Brandy, and Jack are here. I will be moderating our session today, like I mentioned. Um, and we have, some, we have some guidelines and a few housekeeping items for everyone that's watching um, to go over quickly before we get started. Uh, we are recording and hosting the session today, thanks to our friends at RoomPact. And we want to thank them for being part of our team and their contributions, not only to our team, but to the field. Uh, so thank you to those of you on the room pack team. Uh, for our attendees today, um, like we've seen so far, go ahead and use that chat function to ask us questions, drop a comment or something that might spark uh, your brain. Um, we will be monitoring the chat. I'll be following along. Um, please use the chat function to ask your questions as well. Um, I'll, I will do my best to try and mix those in as we um, are able to. And if there are any things that um, we can hold to the end, we'll do that as well. Um, but engage with one another in this space as well. It's not just the folks here on the panel. Um, there is learning that can take place virtually in a chat. I guarantee you that our students are doing that in their courses. So utilize that function while, we're, while you're here with us today. Um, the last thing is um, for our, for our uh, panelists, um, just keep your microphone muted to reduce ba background noise in between responses um, and everything will go great, I'm sure. All right, so with that being said, are we ready to jump in panelists? Yes. Yeah, let's Paul's do this. Ready. Jack's ready. I'm excited. And Brandy's ready, awesome. So like I started off, we are talking today about academic and curricular engagement within residential education. Uh, let's start with something simple, something to just get the conversation going. And Paul, I'm going to actually ask if you wouldn't mind starting on this one. Um, why should an institution consider curricular engagement? And we've got your face. There you are. That mustache is killer. <laughs> It's all I can grow. <laughs> all right, so your question, why should institutions consider curricular engagement and what are some initial steps departments can take to shift from a programmatic to a curricular model? Yeah, uh, so when I think about the why of considering curricular engagement, I really place it in the context of 
higher education history. You know, if you look, especially in, in recent memory, a lot of the trends in higher education, uh, declining state support uh, over time, which is also likely only to get worse within the next couple of years, uh, increased calls for accountability. I know folks, you folks at USF, uh, know about accountability in the state of Florida. Congratulations on being number one. Um, but there, there needs to be a different way of doing things and doing it smarter and with less resources. And a lot of our, our previous approaches, especially programming, are pretty resource intensive uh, in terms of money for budgets for programming and, and the staff. And I think you really need to rethink, uh, are we doing this in the best way? I think the other thing about that is our students are different. Their reality is different. When I went to college, uh, and we wanted to watch a movie, you know, the option was Resence Life Cinema, which was a videotape that was in the Res Life office that would just play on loop and you had about three to four choices that would be changed out once a week. Um, students now can see any movie anytime they want, anywhere, talk to anyone, whether they're on campus or not, for free. Um, and so engagement's gonna look different uh, for them. You know, why, if I can do all these other things, why do I want to go to your program? And so if you think about this curricular approach in the 10 essential elements, it really challenges you to think, how are we engaging students and how can we do that in a diverse way, in a targeted way that really gets them the most essential things that they need to be successful uh, and we can do in a way that, that works for them. <clears throat> so as people start to go down this path, um, you know, the natural inclination is I'm gonna hop on Google uh, and I'm gonna see what's out there. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there. I spend a lot of time developing many of those resources, um, but that only gives you part of the picture. Uh, it's really hard, uh, even with reading through those resources, to really understand what type of paradigmatic shift this is. Uh, it's a cultural shift. It's something that takes years. It's not something an intern can do as a summer project in two months and be done. Um, and so that's where the Institute on the Curricular Approach really kind of comes into play. Uh, I always tell folks if they want to do it, that's, that's really where they have to go. Uh, they're the folks that originated it. I served on the faculty of it. I continue to serve on the faculty of it. Um, and that's what will really start your journey. You know, after that, there's a lot of great other conferences that maybe have some sessions on it. There are folks that go to campuses that will do a training for your entire staff. I do that. Uh, Keith Edwards does that. Hillary Lichterman does that. There's a number of people that do that. Um, and that can also help uh, your staff get it. So if you're thinking about this and thinking about curricular approach and these ideas sound great, uh, know that it is not something that happens overnight because it requires a complete rethinking down to the basic premises on, on how you run your, your operation as to, to what you think about. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I start off when, when talking with folks thinking about this. Yeah, I think what you shared, especially, you know, I've been working with our curriculum for about five years now, and that cultural piece is so important from an institution lens, from a departmental lens, that takes time. And so this is not overnight, like you were saying, that Google search will only take you so far. So really putting in the time and effort, I really appreciate what you had to say about that. Brandy and Jack, did you have anything you wanted to add about why institutions should consider a curricular approach to their work? Yeah, I think uh, definitely when we're talking about that culture and that, that kind of like DNA that a curriculum kind of embeds in a department, I think that has been extremely vital when we look at uh, what's happened with our institution and institutions across the nation with COVID and how that impacted us. I think the fact that here, I can speak for here at the University of South Florida, because we had that and the curriculum behind us, which really gave us an embedded DNA of what our department is, what we want to do to serve our students. And we had the laid out plan of, at this point in time, this is where we want our students to be developing. This is the resources that we have prepared for them. We were ready to take a challenge that COVID presented to us and that complete change that it had to our whole semester, but also make action almost immediately because we had that background, because we had that DNA within us and because we had really been focusing on for you know years and years and years before i was here michael was here brandy was here um that work had been done and that had been continuously improved that when a challenge like covid came around we were ready to face it so not only is it great because we provide that dna and that um, intentional learning experiences for our students during the school year um, but it also helps us in times of complete you know when everything's turned on its head as well we were able to step up, we were able to try new things, and we were able to experiment 
uh, because we had that groundwork behind us and because we had the uh, the curriculum behind us to allow us to do so. So it gave us a bit more freedom to be creative as well, which I think is something that um, I would encourage our, our colleagues uh, across the nation to be doing right now, especially when we're looking at curricular approach. This is a great time to be experimenting with things and trying new things when it comes to how we're impacting and reaching our students. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So a curriculum allows us to be nimble. It allows us to meet our students where they're at, engage them outside the classroom, which is what they're looking for. And like Paul mentioned, students are pulled in a lot of different directions these days. And the curriculum using multiple strategies really gives us the, the ability to meet them in different avenues. It's not just a program. It's not just a bulletin board. It's not just a newsletter. It's all of those pieces brought together. And so when we think about innovative measures um, you may have implemented to engage students, what are some of those things that you may have done in any of your roles? Um, what made them unique and how can this strategy maybe be reimagined at a different university or a different institution that might be listening today? Anybody can jump in on that one. I think I can get started on this one. Um, so a passion area of mine is actually parent and family programs as well. And so um, with the new generation, one of the big things is that parents and families are really involved in their students' experience and supporting their student. And so one thing that we did this past year was actually create a parent infographic for um, our parents and families that really, um, worked with our residential curriculum to help parents and guide them in asking those right questions for their students um, that aligned with our curriculum. And so sometimes like we just don't know um, because we haven't been there, we haven't done that. And so, you know, making sure that we were also supporting our parents and families to also engage with their student and promote that. Um, and we've done that through a few ways, building our relationship with our parent and family programs office. Um, we actually did a dessert with the Dean's event during family weekend and um, utilized our collaborations with our deans to recreate and reimagine our dinner with the Dean events that we do with our students. So we had an opportunity to create a space for students and parents and families to engage together in the space, learn more about the curriculum, learn more about what we're doing as a department, and also have the space to ask those academic questions as well. Um, so really just engaging them has been something very unique and a little different that we've enjoyed doing this year. That's really great, Brandy. I appreciate you sharing how part our our parents and our families are partners in their adventure, right? And so making sure that they are just as much buying into the work that we do in the halls and, and equipping them also with the language and the topics that we're talking about in our curriculum throughout the year so that they can, it's, it's a way to enhance learning for our students more than anything we could do if, an, if a parent or a guardian can engage with their student as well. Um, it is a great opportunity for our students. Paul, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, one, one thing that I always say whenever I work with a school on a curricular approach is when, is when it comes to intentional conversations. Um, a lot of schools do intentional conversations. Uh, some schools that don't use a curricular approach utilize them. Um, but one thing that I've found is uh, it's not an essential element that if you have a curriculum, you have to do intentional conversations. But I have never found a school that does a curriculum that does not do that. Um, and I think the reason for that and part of the, the innovative ways that you have to think about engagement is a program is more akin to a lecture, right? You've got a one to many usually type engagement model. Uh, an intentional conversation, which is typically an RA sitting down with that staff, that student, guiding them through a series of questions that are probably timed to where they are throughout the year, uh, is a one to one more mentorship style. Uh, relationship. And so if you use the analogy of a classroom and you think of all the different ways in which uh, a teacher can engage their students, group work, lecture, um, writing a paper individually, all the different ways, watching a video, etc. That's really kind of that bag for innovative measures that I think Residence Life hasn't, it's only begun to scratch the surface on. Um, kind of even going back to what Jack said in terms of transitioning because of COVID, when you're clear in what your outcomes are, you're much more able to pivot. But if you also have a diverse array of strategies, 
some of those are gonna translate better into a digital environment than others, right? An intentional conversation, great. We can hop on a video chat and I can do that very, very easily. Uh, a lot different than trying to figure out what might a program look like uh, digitally, right? That it may work this way, we'd have to tweak it. There's a lot more shifting that you need to do. So I think in terms of think of the innovative, innovative part of it, um, also means how can we diversify it and think about all the different ways we engage our students for different types of learning, for different types of content, what's successful, uh, and it all kind of comes together. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, being boots on the ground, we see, we see ghost residents too, right? So an intentional conversation isn't something that meets all of our students where they're at all the time, right? And so, but at the same time, those intentional conversations for us here at USF serve as some of the most important things because we learn so much about a student through those conversations. And those few that maybe fall through the loophole we're finding we connect with in other ways um, and can get creative about how we engage them in other ways outside of just an intentional conversation. So um, I appreciate you sharing that, Paul. Jack, was there something you wanted to share too? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sadly, I don't think this is gonna be the first and last time that I mention our initiative Balls in the Cloud, which we've been implementing uh, through the summer, which um, uh, Michael was a huge part of, and so was Brandy. Um, and it was a massive effort that a lot of us at the, the university were able to implement. But a real quick summary is that Balls in the Cloud was our online Canvas plays, which served as a hub for our students um, during COVID and now moving forward into summer. And I think the reason why I wanted to mention this with the, uh, you know, the new ways that we're reaching students and coming up with new ways to do that is when we were creating online and virtual spaces and online virtual ways to engage with students, whether that was, you know, moving our passes online or moving our discussions or our uh, individual connections or our actual, you know, face to face programming. Something that was really surprising, which now when I reflect back on it shouldn't have been in the first place was that we were getting students in those online spaces don't don't usually attend our like in person in hall spaces, which really opened up a whole new door for us in thinking about okay what does our curriculum look like for upcoming semesters, you know this. Um, this situation that you know has been very hard on a lot of us had almost opened up new day uh, new doors for us to you know impact students in future gener uh, future years and semesters coming so. What was great about that is that we were able to build those connections with those students and then flex our muscles in online ways and virtual spaces um, to be able to do some of the work that we do within our curriculum, but also look at it in a different lens and try different things to impact those students. So some of the things that I think have been, have been great with that is honestly, some, some of our students don't like the face to face connection. So taking away that camera and having that conversation via a chat, it seems different for some of our students and they impact different ways. Uh, Michael can contest this because we done a lot of our streams together and this is why he's such a good moderator is because you know we've had a lot of practice over the last couple of uh, months or so but we were able to build connections that started off virtually as like hey what building were you in you know how's how's uh, how are you dealing with everything how's your online classes to some of our students eventually being able to build uh, relationships with us virtually to the point where they were able to you know disclose things that they were having um, you know, concerns about their mental health or some concerns about, you know, the academics and we we're able to assess them that way as well. So I think with innovative ways that we've been able to use our curriculum and develop things is, you know, really thinking about, okay, those students that we aren't hitting now that we have access to these virtual spaces and these virtual events and this new light of uh, doing the work that we do, how is that also helping other students connect with us? And I think we've been able to see that over the last couple of months. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we keep talking about students, 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 right? That's our work. Uh, they're at the core of everything that we do. Um, and I think one thing that some sometimes is missed is having our student voice um, in our in our curricular model or in our programmatic model for schools that are still at that stage. Um, so Brandy, I was wondering if you could start us off by sharing a little bit about how um, you've seen um, buy-in and sustained interest in our curriculum from our students, um, and what are some things that uh, we can do to bring students into the fold in that way? 
Yeah, I think one of the big things is really meeting students where they are. Um, so, you know, with this current generation, they want to know the what's in it for me. So what are we, you know, giving to them that they feel is tangible that's going to support them in their career goals, their academic engagement. Um, and so, you know, for us, it was really you know, what can they take away? Is it a new relationship with a faculty member where we've connected them because of their career goals and now they feel that they've created this mentor through this event? Um, how are we creating spaces where we, you know, really are just humans having conversations? I think that's such a big piece of this is, you know, yes, residential curriculum is a book, but how are we not like putting the book in front of us and saying, okay, let's look at this lesson plan and go through this. How are we creating those organic opportunities with our students? Um, but also how are we listening to them? How are we looking at trends through the feedback that we're getting, the assessment that we're getting, and how are we taking our foundation and continuing to build upon that foundation to make it better for the next year? Um, one of the big things that we did this year was actually we brought in a student staff member to help us create and talk from a student staff member working um, with students on the daily to go ahead and look at the educational plan and say what are we missing where are we hitting things at where are we not hitting things at because right we don't always live in the hall on the floor with the students all the time um, and so sometimes our student staff see things that we don't see that really opens our eyes and allows us to really engage with those students to create that buy-in because we're really meeting them where they are yeah i i know that one of my ras this year worked with uh, our curriculum team that brandy and jack help with here at usf and not only was that um, meaningful to the team that was refining and working on our curriculum for next year, but it was also meaningful to that RA, um, feeling valued in a space that they otherwise maybe wouldn't sit in. And so um, finding ways to gather that feedback, whether that be in a one-on-one -on -one with a staff member or a staff meeting um, as a way of assessing our curriculum is so important to the work that we do. Um, and can really shed some light on what we might be missing the mark on and where we need to make adjustments for the for the next year. Paul? Yeah, and one thing to, for folks that are special, especially for folks that are beginning this journey, but even for folks that are still alongside it, right? Remember part of this is culture building. So, you know, first year out of the gate, maybe you're trying some new things. Students at first, maybe not your first year students because they don't know any differently, but your upper class students are gonna be like, what's this? You're trying to interact with me in a completely different way. Um, and part of that's just gonna take time. And that is completely 100% natural. You know, at the same time, staff members who may be initiating it are also gonna say, hey, wait a minute, you just changed my job responsibilities or expectations on what I do. And so uh, for a lot of folks, especially at the very beginning and the transition, you have to build that culture in your staff. You have to build that culture with your students at the same time. It will get better, I promise. Um, it does require care and tending, so it's never completely done. Um, but there is a little bit more heavy lifting that goes on at the beginning um, in order to do that. And then do the things just like Brandy said and, and really get into and make ingrain that in part of the culture. Um, it, does take, it does take some time. Yeah, and with that, um, I see that Chester uh, dropped a comment, culture building with campus partners. We're talking about students, but I mean, campus partners are huge. Um, Paul, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when the, one of the last institutions where I initiated a curriculum, uh, we decided that we want to increase some of our academic content in the halls. So things squarely related to major career major choice, things like that. And so uh, I remember reaching out to the College of Arts and Sciences at that institution. Uh, and no one in residence life had ever done that before. Uh, like that was just the College of Arts and Science never even thought of that as an option. Uh, they never even, you know, res ed had never even done anything like that before. Uh, and in that specific case, they were great. I said, I wanna help you. I didn't say I wanted to take it over. I said, I wanna amplify the great work that you're doing and give you more resources and more support. I have staff, I have a little bit of money. Um, I have students that are captive in one physical location. There are a lot of things that I can do to help you out. Um, and in that case, it went amazingly. 
um, in terms of that collaboration. But you might have some partners that are frankly just not interested. Uh, sometimes they might be smaller departments that are saying, I don't even know if I have the bandwidth uh, to do this. But I think that's also where Res Ed comes in and says, if you don't have the bandwidth, use some of ours, because the content and the work that you do is important. And we recognize that in terms of our goals for students, and we want to help you. So really going in with that mentality and trying to work with departments that I would say, by and large, are usually open to it. Um, helping them understand what you're hoping to achieve can sometimes be a little bit more difficult because it will require sustained conversation. Um, but doing that also takes some time. Uh, you will have some folks in some departments who have done it this way. They have always done it this way. They have no interest in doing it any other way. Um, and I'm sure we all know who those folks are. Uh, but there are campus partners that want to do that work. And so you kind of have to pick and choose and figure out how can you do this in the best way possible. Usually they'll come along once they start seeing, oh, now I'm missing out on this, right? What I resisted before is now working and I'm the odd person out. Sometimes they'll come around. Yeah, and, and even, you know, I, I know that I've been in those spaces where we've met with a campus partner and it's less about how many times have we sent an email that says, hey, can you put on this program for us? Um, can you come in and give a talk about this topic in wellness because we're not the experts and you are? There are so many different ways in a curriculum where we can just tap them for their knowledge, right? We can include them in the conversation to say, hey, here are the ways that we are looking to implement that in our curriculum. And it's not in an event. It's not in a program. It's in other ways. And we want to make sure we are talking about the right things and preparing our staff to talk about the right things. Yeah, you don't want to go in with a transactional mindset, right? Can you come in here, parachute in, do this program, and then leave gives you right back to the previous model, right? You want to deeply integrate it. You want to partner with them. That's different some, from some of the trans, transactional process, processes that we sometimes call partnerships, um, but really <laughs> are just an exchange. Yeah, no question about that. Um, so I have, I'm going to pivot us a little bit because we have a great question from Natasha. Um, Natasha asks, um, if we could talk a little bit about strategies we used, um, to talk about equity and social justice within curriculum, um, in order to take the variety of experiences into consideration that students may have based on identities, intersecting identities, um, how are all of those, how, how do we take a social justice lens and implement that into our curriculum? And what does a curriculum allow us to do taking a social justice and equity lens? Anybody can start. So jump in whenever you're ready. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take a little bit about this. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because one of the things actually I'm writing right now is originally it was how might an institution decide to change their goals and outcomes for students in response to COVID-19 specifically, where you know now certain things are maybe more important than others. Um, but then of course, in the past week, I've been thinking even more deeply about given everything that happened um, with how are we gonna adjust to all the, the social change that's going on right now and the pain and all these other pieces. Um, there's some great campuses that are, that are doing some interesting things around this. Uh, I know that um, University of Oklahoma has delved into this uh, quite a bit. Um, there are ways that you can use uh, community dialogues in interesting ways. Uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County uh, uses a restorative justice model uh, in a lot of their practices, which is actually really great if you're trying to engage in some social justice work and, and discussion of identity, because that, that lens actually um, is very complementary to that kind of work. Um, one of the things that when I would go to a campus, we talk about their goals. It, inevitably, there would be some social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion related set of goals and outcomes. I don't think I've ever found an institution that doesn't have those for its students. Um, one of the things that I had to mention for the institution, and I think this is different now than it probably was even two weeks ago, um, is depending on where your institution is, is it a state institution? Is it a private institution? Um, this is educational work. So you're saying this is what we want students to achieve. There are political forces that will argue that that is not your place to do that type of work or will argue with you that this is not a goal that you should have with a student. Some will call it brainwashing. Some will, you know, typically it is of the 
the trope that it is the liberal higher education establishment trying to promote these specific ends. Um, <clears throat> so when you engage in education around politicized topics, um, you really need to do that in a very thoughtful way. Um, and you also have to recognize what are the political implications in your state? What does that mean? What could that mean for your staff? What could that even mean for your students um, when going down this path? Um, but there clearly needs to be work done here. Um, but some institutions may land at that very differently than another one. Um, but that is clearly present. It is going on right, we are watching it on TV, uh, not as it relates to higher education specifically right now, but it, it's that same kind of thing. So I, I will give that little asterisk, um, but also encourage people to push the envelope on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're in a heightened time and I think that that makes this work even more important and it's something we should be thinking about all the time. And speaking from a USF perspective, we have global citizenship built into our residential curriculum as one of our learning goals. And we look through the lens of social justice into every strategy that we have. Um, we have a, a large international student population and how are they impacted by COVID decisions? How are they impacted by government shutdowns that happened a few years ago? Um, we have students from a variety of backgrounds that make their way to campus, especially like Natasha said, with intersecting identities um, at play. And so we look at um, all of our lesson plans with a, with a fine tooth comb to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our students and then listening to our students to find out where they're at and what they need for us and letting that curriculum like we talked about earlier pivot so that we can meet them where they're at so natasha i appreciate you um, sharing that question with us and i hope that we we helped even a little bit um, i know uh, v scott we have a question from you i was hoping uh, maybe if you could just drop a little bit more information for me just to help me out with what you're looking for. I'd appreciate that in the chat. Um, but Martha, we see your question because that's the next topic we're going to talk about. Um, we are going to talk about our transition to a digital and virtual world um, because that is the world that we are living in. And despite the fact that many institutions will be open for the fall, what that means, a lot of us are still unclear. And uh, the virtual engagement piece is not going away anytime soon. Um, and so we need to be prepared for that and using this time over the summer to hopefully find some ways to do that. So um, Jack, why don't you start us off? I know you mentioned bulls in the cloud here at USF. Um, how are you, how are we scaffolding student learning um, considering our transition to a virtual engagement environment? Yeah, uh, that, that was definitely uh, quite the journey that we're still taking part on, right? And we're still trying to slowly figure out. Um, I think when we look at scaffolding, when it comes to digital engagement, I, I think it came in in two different ways. It was definitely that scaffolded learning for our students, um, which I know that we've spoken a little bit about already, but it was also interesting because we had scaffolded learning experiences for our professional staff members and our student staff members as well, right? So. Um, those of us who are tasked with creating like that virtual engagement tend to be the ones that already have that experience, whether that is from, um, as you can tell from the stuff behind me, like having a, a passion for video games and online culture and stuff like that. Um, or if it's something the way you've watched Twitch before, or you're into streaming or something, you kind of get that understanding of where that kind of idea of building community in a virtual space begins but for a lot of our staff members as well that is a completely you know strange thing and it's almost like talking a different language when we start talking about streaming and building a community so i think when we start thinking about that scaffolded learning online the first step for i would suggest to people and encourage people is is doing that with your staff as well don't feel like our professional staff are going to suddenly have this knowledge they've done their research on how to use um, you know, Zoom in an amazing way or, you know, the Insta uh, Instagram stars and all this stuff, it really doesn't come that easy. And I will say that because we made mistakes in the way that we've done that as well. Um, it was a big learning experience for us and we expected too much of our staff too soon. Um, not to say that they couldn't handle it, but it, what I mean by that is that it was suddenly a lot happening all at once. Um, and we didn't prepare them correctly to be able to, you know, take that scaffolded learning steps into be able to, you know, do the same for their students. Um, I think when we look at it in a student lens, that scaffolded learning, 
Um, as we mentioned before, we were lucky enough to already have that backbone with, uh, with our curriculum, right? We have that work where we had different avenues about how to interact with students and how to, what ones of those could be moved online, which ones couldn't, which ones do we have to adapt? Um, but I think what we were able to do with them as well is slowly ease that as well. So the big thing that I think about when it comes to scaffolded learning in an online space is consistency, right? So a lot of successful people who build community and are able to connect with community in an online space, the reason why they do that is because they do that at a consistent basis. Um, if you think of YouTubers that you like to watch or TV shows that are sent online, or even if you are into streaming, the streamers that tend to be successful are the people that post at the same time, the same day, at the same spot. Um, and that's something that we try to kind of um, think about when we were creating online content is we wanted to do that as well. So our students knew that they could receive this resource um, at a certain time. Um, so when they were looking for that, they knew when the new one would be coming up. Um, with that as well, it also gave us time to divvy out what we were doing, um, as well as prepare and plan and do research and use the analytical data that we were gathering slowly from doing online work and remote work to be able to plan ourselves. Um, Michael and I and Brandy will use, I'll use an example of what we had with Balls in the Cloud. Um, we went full out the gate with a full-fledged stream schedule. We were like, we're going to be streaming uh, episodes of you know, meditation or cooking or uh, interactive community building every single day and it's going to be great and students are going to be there. But obviously we learned very quickly that that wasn't the case because one, we weren't preparing ourselves to be able to do that and we weren't preparing ourselves to be able to have the time to learn how to do this. But we also weren't preparing our students to get used to learning to use that online space. You know, they were learning to do that with their classes and they were learning to do that with library resources and any um, counseling resources that they had, like everything that was on their college campus was suddenly online and we didn't want to suddenly be another thing that was being thrown in their face. We understood that at this point in time that academics came first, so we had to take a step back and figure out how we could scaffold that as well. So it took us time and it took us to um, and make mistakes and admit to those mistakes to get to that point. But I think the, the best thing that we had done was, as mentioned before, was that buying from students and listening to students about what they wanted and what they liked. And we were honest about what we were able, what wasn't working and what was working. Um, and I think when we look forward into the fall, we're now at a position where because we tried things and because we were creative and, you know, let things fail, let things grow and adapted and changed pretty regularly in, a, in an online world. Um, we now have stuff that we know students will engage with. We now have stuff that we know maybe we have to remove, uh, you know, passively more on a discussion board basis or something that might be a video or a Prezi that they can click through on our main page uh, to be able to do that. So I think it, it all came down to being, as I think it's mentioned a thousand times today, being patient with the work that we're doing. And even though COVID has taken that time away from us to a certain extent, um, it's also allowed us more time to be creative and make mistakes and try new things in a place where if it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well right now. And we, we scrap that and we try something new. Yeah, it definitely is a process. Um, making sure that we're meeting our students where they're at and, and, and even taking what we already had planned and just making it virtual, right? So don't overthink things and think that you need to be all things to all your students all the time. Um, that is not what we're here to do with the curriculum. We have multiple strategies. And so whether that be a passive resource that you send out to students, whether that be um, a conversation that you, when you make a phone call to a student, you're talking about those things or um, you're doing the live streaming like Jack talked about, um, you can get creative with that and meet and get to the core of what students are really looking for. Um, what are some, Brandy or Paul or Jack, if you want to jump back in, how are you, um, when we think about the virtual engagement piece as well, how, um, the words I'm looking for, how are we building in that a curriculum is built on the idea that it, it's like Lego blocks. They build on one another as it, as it goes. Um, and, and then we're, we're thrown in for a loop with virtual engagement and a quick adjustment. How are we able to combat that and still be able to have this, this building block perspective of a curriculum when now we're in virtual engagement with our students? I 
I think from an AI standpoint, um, for us, it was we knew that this was going to be an academic challenge for our students. Um, we knew this was going to be something new. And also, it wasn't just new for our students, it was also new for our faculty. And so, um, how are we creating spaces for students to really ask questions at first? And then how are we building upon that based off of the decisions the university was making as we went on? Um, so one thing that we did was every Monday, we did an afternoon tea with the AI team. Um, and so the first one started off with like, let's chat, like, let's just talk about the changes. Let's just kind of like, you can come talk about what you want, ask questions for us, we're here for you. Um, the next week, you know, a grading option came out. So how are we breaking that down? How are we reading the fine print for our students to help support them in making that decision? Um, we hit week three, everyone hit that kind of bump in the road with wellness, their home, it's been 14 days, um, you know, we're working on week three and people aren't socializing. We've constantly, we've gone from this living in a residence hall to now they're sitting at home again. They're adjusting to being back home. They're adjusting to being in a residence hall that doesn't have everyone in it. And so it's quiet, it's a little lonely. And so um, how are we creating things to help students de-stress? Um, talking about, you know, I did a session on how do you kind of repurpose things? How do you, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, how do you make your own hand sanitizer with what you have? How do you take an old t-shirt and make a face mask? Um, so really adapting things to the times and being flexible every week. We knew that we were coming on on Mondays, but we didn't really make that decision on what we were talking about until the week before because we knew every week it was going to change um, which is something we just had to work through for our students as trends came about because it was new for everyone absolutely and so uh, Jack started talking about this a little bit um, I'll open it up to all of you so uh, everybody is looking to make the shift right the shift of some sort of digital engagement within our curriculum. We're not gonna fully be there. Maybe some of us are, some of us aren't. Um, what, are, what are some things that come to mind that they should consider when making that transition um, to make those decisions and in the planning phase? Paul, maybe get us started. Yeah, um, think about your own experience. Think about an RE on a physical floor. So what are the things that we do? Well, one, we build residence halls, right? We physically construct them. So you have to create the spaces, the residence halls, the bulls in the cloud portal, the chat room, the Facebook page, whatever those mean, you need to create the spaces. Um, we also know in our jobs that we can just throw students into those spaces, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna engage with one another, right? So what do we do? We put an RA there. So we have a staff member that is helping with that process. So when you create those digital spaces, you do need a staff member that has some intention. Now, when we think about who are good staff members doing that and staff members who may be a little bit lacking in that, um, the good staff members are the ones that are actively engaging and speaking with and talking with different, different students. The same thing would apply in a digital environment. So, you know, if I create this space, Who's the one that's actually trying to start those conversations or having things go on in there to try to do that or reaching out to individual students and say, hey, I'd really like it if you'd kind of come in here and do this and do that active reach out. It's actually the exact same kinds of principles that are in the digital space. But I, I think where we sometimes get hung up is we'll create this digital space. Great, like, great. Students will populate it and do what they're going to do. And my work here is done. Um, really being there to engage, to comment back on things, to uh, you know, provide multiple methods of, of engagement is really what you need to do to try to make those spaces work. Um, it is I've admittedly significantly harder to get students to adopt a new platform than to go to the ones that they already exist on, right? So if you're like, great, we're gonna create our own social network, um, you're creating a lot more work on yourself for engagement than if you try to go to the places where they already are um but it can be done and there are principles of that kind of community management um i'll name drop josie alquist uh, a little bit she does a lot of work with this she and i had very similar dissertation topics uh for their P for our phds uh and she's doing a lot of this kind of work now so if you check out some of her her work uh 
she's talking about it a lot. And she actually, there's a digital events community space that she works with and she models that. So like every week she's posting something, asking about people's weeks, prompting things, replying, being active. Um, it really does require that type of engagement in order for those things to more take off. You can't just set them and let them go um, or have isolated things and expect that students will suddenly just say, oh, I'm going to engage in all of these things. Like you, it's, it's a culture building. It's an active thing. It's, it's being the best RA that you would hope and doing the same kind of best RA behaviors in those spaces um, that you would do just in a digital environment. Yeah, no question. I know that we saw that as well here at USF about getting our RAs to be um, just as involved as they could be, right? Because, and, and that almost took some more of their time than they normally would have. So trying to balance those things. Jack, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that's a great transition, Mike, into obviously the, this change was massive for our RAs as well. So when we look at this online space um, back in, the, in, in spring and now moving forward into the new fall, uh, it really was a sudden change in their RA expectations and what we were asking from them. Um, I think stuff that we did find success, successful was, you know, suddenly creating those clear guidelines of what we expect from them and being really realistic within that. I'm really glad that Brandy brought it up is that, you know, that academic change and that academic workload that suddenly hit them was, was huge. And then we forgot, I think it's easy to forget sometimes that uh, obviously our, our RAs were struck having that as well as thousands of questions from their residents at that point in time. Um, and they're going to continue to have that when we move into the fall as well, right? Because it's going to be, for some of us, a completely online um, experience. It's going to be a mix for some people. It might be in person for others. And I think that's going to attract a lot more questions onto our RAs and the expectations that they have because they're going to, uh, their students are going to have friends at different institutions that are doing different things um, and who are having friends from other institutions doing completely different things. You know, that for that college experience is going to be dramatically different next year. So one thing that we tried to do here at USF was set those clear guidelines for those RAs. Okay, so we have this big stream coming up or this big online initiative coming up right now. Who are our student leaders on our floors as well as our RAs who we think will be great around this? And when thinking about uh, AI and our LLCs, which uh, LLC RAs and which LLC leaders do we think would be great to kind of be a voice for this. So sometimes we, we are the voice for our students, right? And if we say something, they learn from us. Uh, but sometimes students learn best from students and they follow other students better. So taking a step back and sometimes I ask my RAs, okay, I would love for you to be at this stream and be active within uh, the chat and almost be a moderator yourself. So asking questions to the, the presenters so they don't feel like they're, you know, walking on quicksand or asking questions to your students who you know have been vocal about this stuff or have questions, uh, but also relying on them as well to be like, hey, I know you have a student leader on your floor that really, really is a great resource for other students and is kind of like, you know, the, the, the heart and soul of kind of the social aspect of the floor encourage them to come along, ask them that you need them right now, use them as a role model for the floor and tell them that their community really needs them. Because if you get that resident saying, hey, I'm going to this stream today, or I'm coming to this online event, or I'm going to engage in uh, this, this online space, others are going to follow suit. And then again, use them as that almost moderator. Um, I think we've seen today how easy this conversation flows online when you have someone like Mike following up with those questions, you know, directing those questions, interacting with the chat here. When you have students that are in that chat as well and being that person for you, and when you are also asking RAs to do that, it tackles a lot of things that we've asked today. That, buy, that buying from students in a remote world, it's there, there if you're leaning on them. That um, understanding of how we're doing in and of things, you know, students being a part of that is, is, is something that we have a massive opportunity for right now. So I think something I would encourage my colleagues uh, would be when we're looking at online spaces, really focus about what that RA role means within that, but also be thinking about what it really means to be a student leader in an online space as well. Yeah, and Brandy, I actually got a question that I was hoping you could help me with here. Um, because it relates to the work that we've done with our Bulls in the Cloud page and specifically platforms. So um, I think our students are pulled in so many different directions, whether it be Facebook, which they're not necessarily on as much anymore. They're definitely on Twitter. They're definitely on Instagram. Um, 
can you talk a little bit about using university platforms like a Canvas, a Blackboard versus other social media platforms and maybe our experience with that? Yeah, I think we have so many platforms out there. Um, so for us, we built it in Canvas, which is the learning management system that we use at USF. Um, and we did that because students were comfortable with that. We just launched Microsoft Teams not too long ago. So pro staff is working in it. We're doing great. Um, but our students are still transitioning to that. So we weren't quite there yet with them. Um, so for us, we needed to build it in something they were familiar with because so much change had just happened for them that adding in a new platform would have just like, it just wouldn't have been successful. And so for us, there was a lot of conversations around, okay, all of their classes are now on there. So not only are they getting notifications about all their classes, but now we're also giving them notifications about bulls in the cloud. Um, so that was one of the issues that we had run into with that. And one of the things that we did to mitigate that was create a schedule of we're going to send out one announcement on Sunday. Here's the week's schedule. We're going to send out one announcement that just says, here's what's happening today. Join us. Um, so really thinking about that um, was a really big thing because we didn't want to overwhelm students even more with us posting these things than getting notifications for it. Um, because we recognize students were like, I can't be in this because we're getting a lot of notifications and it's overwhelming to me. Can you please remove me? And that was not the purpose of it. Um, but I also work on our training committee. And so something we've talked about is since training um, is still pretty much virtual, um, thinking about how, how are we going to do that? How are we still setting up our student staff and our pro and graduate staff to prepare them for next year, making sure that they have the tools that they need. And so we are actually exploring using Microsoft Teams now because our students have now been integrated into it. Um, so, you know, we can promote on Instagram, we can promote on Twitter, but really that promotion is really to kind of grab them, to grab their attention and tailor it into and move them into Canvas and also Microsoft Teams. So we want to create that engagement and then we kind of want to guide them into it. Um, almost kind of like a virtual residential roundup is I guess what you could say about it. Um, making sure that we're just kind of hitting them at different points with promotion, but also trying not to overwhelm where they are in their academic spaces too. And one thing to think about too, when you look at those platforms, so in my research on social media, let's say you're using existing, you know, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter, et cetera. Um, do know that students of different identities will sometimes congregate in different spaces. So um, if you are a black student, you are much more likely to be on Twitter than those of other races. Uh, if you are a white woman, you love Pinterest. That's what the statistics say. Um, so different groupings can be in different spaces. Uh, and so you need to think through that. Who is our population? Where are they? Who am I trying to reach? You know, if I choose one, am I excluding whole, like a large chunk of another population? Uh, the other thing to think about is um, <clears throat> most, not all, but a large majority of students will have internet access. But people of lower socioeconomic status typically only get their internet access through their mobile phones. So you also have to think about, are the platforms we, use, we are using mobile ready? You know, you should be concerned, do they have internet access or not? But I think even more important is, is it, is it mobile friendly uh, in that? So um, that's another kind of layer is think through what does access look like? Where are people in these spaces? Um, and in terms of data, that I saw that question come in there, the Pew Internet American Life Project, so if you just go to pewinternet.org, P-E-W, um, they do a lot of statistics on these kinds of things. That's where I, I know them from. They're the best in terms of a domestic United States, uh, who uses it, who doesn't, who uses what, et cetera. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. That's really good stuff to know. And even good for me to know, as I've been trying bulls in the cloud stuff, and we've had great successes and some massive failures. And that probably tells a little bit about our students and where they live, um, virtually where they live. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour, but I have one last question um, that was asked. Um, so um, our, one of our attendees, V. Scott, um, asked the question, um, let me find it. I just lost it. Um, there it is. What are some strategies that, um, 
that will incorporate the curriculum based model and in intentional programming. And when following up with that, uh, he, uh, v Scott provided a good example. Um, if you see that there is an increase in campus vandalism or bullying, creating a program to address the issue. How, how does a curriculum fit into that sort of lens? Uh, I'll take a stab at this one because I, I did a, a presentation at ACPA with uh, Aaron Simpson from University of Oklahoma on something very similar. Um, to me, they're not in opposition. If you have a good residential curriculum, then you have space built in to be adaptive to needs that emerge at the time. Um, so one of the thing, one strategy that's used, so I'll use Oklahoma's as an example. They had a pre-made facilitation guide for when a racist incident occurs on campus, a very visible one. Um, they knew that was going to happen. They didn't know when it was going to happen. They didn't know the specifics of what that would be, what that would look like, but they knew one would happen. And so what they did is, is they already planned out some outcomes, lined up some strategies for working through that. And then when inevitably something did happen, they weren't caught flat footed in what is our educational response to this going to be. Um, but they already had a loose plan together. So they actually had a crisis and emergency learning guide uh, ready to go for those kinds of things. So thinking ahead uh, for when those large things occur and having a facilitation guide ready to go that then you can tweak and adjust according to the specifics of the situation um, can help you out considerably. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, making sure that you're being really focused in the goals and outcomes you have for your curriculum. So what are the most essential things? Because we want to keep, oh, and this and this and this, and you want to keep adding. But if you get down to your core that you say, if a student walks away from their time in the residence halls and has not achieved this, we have failed. Um, if you can do it that much, then that will create more space for you to adjust if things emerge on a floor. Right? If you've got your staff members doing all these things related to curriculum, that they have no ability to change or adjust a little bit of their, their tactics according to something that emerges on a floor, um, then you're probably trying to cram too many goals and outcomes and too much work onto that staff member. And you need to go back and say, what is most essential and what is not, uh, and create that space. Uh, it's the same, same thing I think about with community development. Um, sometimes when I talk about curriculum, folks are like, well, what about community development and, and having fun and social? And I said, nothing about curriculum says you shouldn't do that. Uh, in fact, they really work in tandem and parallel. Those things should be going on. I think the difference is with a community development initiative, I'm not gonna force you to do a lot of red tape to shove learning outcomes into a social gathering when I just want you to have a social gathering. <laughs> All that time that you would have tried to complicate it Focus, use that time on this and just go to dinner together. That's good enough. I don't, we don't need to make it really hyper complicated. So um, making sure you build in some space with that in your curriculum is an important part. And then having some plans in place that you could then pull out or, or you know, have ready to go. Oh, we have a lot of disordered eating that's going on on this floor. Well, we have a facilitation guide for that. So we need you to integrate this into the work that you do um, can help. Yeah, I think the thing I take away from that, Paul, is a curriculum is not restrictive, right? It, it, it gives us a guide, and when things pop up, it allows us to fill in the gaps and fill in the holes that we weren't maybe expecting. But if we have a little bit of forethought, we can, we can prepare some of those things. And so um, I, I definitely resonate with that, and we've done that here at USF as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember I was teaching in Boston at Boston College when the marathon bombing occurred. Uh, and I was teaching like that night or the next night, I forget exactly when it was. Um, as a teacher, I threw out my lesson plan for that day and we focused on processing through uh, the students' own reactions, their being a helper to other students while also trying to process their own trauma. Um, it didn't mean that I threw away all the learning goals and outcomes for the semester, right? Like we still did that. We adjusted, we added it in. Um, but it didn't mean that I abandoned the goals and outcomes for the course uh, with that. We just pulled something else out, did something, modified some assignments, moved towards where that learning was, um, but still kept on that same track. Absolutely. All right, so we are at 4.05. Got to be conscious of people's time because time is important. 
um, and just say thank you. Thank you for everyone who um, joined in today. I hope that you were able to take something away um, and know that we have more coming up. So uh, there are, we have a full series of webinars planned um, over the next few weeks. Um, I am going to hit enter on the chat because we've got a whole website built out. Um, thanks to Brandy uh, for building that for us um, and the team uh, helping put on the webinar series. Um, check out everything that we have uh, coming up, register for upcoming webinars. And with that, I think that's where we're going to wrap it up. We will see you next time on ResEd 2.0. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.